पाकिस्तान के खिलाफ बहुत सारे महाज खुले कुछ हमने खुद खोले और काफी सारे हमारे खिलाफ खोले गए आज का महाज इमरान खान के नाम पाकिस्तान के सबक वजीर आजम आज अमरीका के सबसे मोतबर सबसे इन्फ्लुंशल अखबार में मैंशन हुए हैं इस अखबार वॉल स्ट्रीट जर्नल के लीडिंग कॉलमनिस्ट ने लिखा है कि अगर इमरान खान साहब वापस इकतदार में आए तो ये पाकिस्तान के लिए जवाल पजीर होगा पाकिस्तान के लिए ये डिजास्टर होगा पाकिस्तान अफोर्ड नहीं कर सकता कि इमरान खान वापस आए आज का महाज एक डिबेट करेगा जो राइटर हैं वो आज हमारे साथ इस शो पे हैं वो मेरे दोस्त भी हैं मेरे कॉलीग भी हैं और आज वो मुझसे डिबेट करेंगे कि वो क्यों समझते हैं कि इमरान खान को वापस नहीं आना चाहिए ये जो डिबेट है ये तो चलेगी मगर इससे पहले कि हम डिबेट में जाएं टाइमिंग बड़ी जरूरी है इस पीस की एक तो इमरान खान के बारे में अमेरिका में पाकिस्तान के बारे में भी ज्यादा खबरें नहीं छपती अगर छपती हैं तो ब्रेकिंग न्यूज की छपती हैं जैसे पिछले दिनों जो वर्चुअल रैली जो वर्चुअल जलसा जो फौज ने दबाया जिसमें इंटरनेट बंद किया उसकी वजह से इमरान खान वॉज इन द न्यूज मगर इसके अलावा जो इस वक्त टाइमिंग है इस पीस की वो बड़ी क्रिटिकल है आसिम मुनीर साहब अभी भी बताया जा रहा है कि अभी भी अमेरिका में है उस तरफ पाकिस्तान में इलेक्शंस अनक्लेयर हैं अभी तक बल्ले का सिंबल जो बैट का साइन है और पीटीआई की जो पार्टिसिपेशन है उस पर क्लैरिटी नहीं है इनफैक्ट जब वकला इमरान खान से मिलने जाते हैं उसे दस्तखत करवाने जाते हैं तो उनको पकड़ लिया जाता है साथ साथ पाकिस्तान में इंटरनल टर्म भी इंक्रीज हो रहा है जो बलोच प्रोटेस्टर्स के साथ जो हुआ है कल रात जो हुआ है वो आप सबके सामने है तो एट अ टाइम व्हेन पाकिस्तान इज इन इंटरनल टर्म एंड एट अ टाइम जब उन हमारा जो आर्मी चीफ है उसकी कोई कवरेज नहीं है तो अमेरिका के सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट सबसे इंफ्लुएंशियल जरीदे ने यह पीस आज क्यों लिखा है वेल वे गोइंग टू फाइंड आउट थ्रू डिबेट विद द राइटर हिमसेल्फ मेरे दोस्त मेरे कॉलीग सदानंद हूं मैं कि आदाब कैसे आप बिल्कुल ठीक हाउ यू वेरी गुड वेरी गुड अब आप बनारस में हैं आपने इतनी दूर से एक जबरदस्त पीस लिखा है हिला के रख दिया है आपने बहुत सारे लोगों ने पुश बैक किया है अब ये अजीब सा पीस है साधारण बिकॉज एक तरफ आपके जो पिछले पीसेस गए हैं आपने इमरान खान की तारीफ की है आपने कहा है कि इनफैक्ट इस पीस में भी आपने बढ़ाया है इमरान खान को कि शायद पाकिस्तान की तारीख का सबसे बड़ा पॉलिटिकल ब्रांड है करोड़ों लोग उसकी लीडरशिप क्वालिटीज में बिलीव करते हैं शायद साउथ एशिया का वाहिद लीडर है जो ईस्ट और वेस्ट ऑक्सफर्ड और खैबर पख्तूखा की पहाड़ियों में कंफर्टेबल होता है तो एक तरफ तो आपने उसकी बड़ी तारीफ की है बट वार्निंग देते हैं आप कि अगर ये आ गया तो पाकिस्तान के लिए अच्छा नहीं होगा और इसके आप तीन रीजन देते हैं एक पैन इस्लामिज्म क्योंकि वो बहुत बड़ा मुसलमान अपने आप को मानता है और कहता है कि मुस्लिम उम्मा को हम साथ करें दूसरा एंटा अमेरिकनिज्म कि वो अमेरिका के खिलाफ है और तीसरा लेफ्ट विंग इकोनॉमिक्स जिस तरीके से वो मीशत को देखता है सो साधारण आई एम गोइंग टू रियली रियली ट्राई टू पुश बैक ऑन दिस वन टूडे हाउ कैन यू टेक सच डिफरिंग पोजिशन यू बिल्ड मैन अप बट यू रियली टेयर डाउन इज पॉलिटिक्स ये ये किया क्या आपने बनारस में बैठे बैठे कौन सा पान खाया आपने बनारस वाला ये ये मैंने वैसे बन, मैं मैं बनारस अभी अभी पहुंचा हूँ <laughs> ये मैंने बैंगलोर में लिखा था बनारसी पान पत्ता फॉर दिसिस लुक आई मीन यू एन आई है you know and and I think that where my views on uh Imran Khan are a little bit different from many of his critics um particularly many of his pakistani critics uh is that i acknowledge that this is a person with a truly compelling story um and the kind of political brand that he has built is something that is really rare not just in pakistan not just in south asia but in the world and so when i you know interact with pti supporters or when i look at pti supporters i don't think of them as bad people i don't call them fascist i don't call them yutia i don't use any pejoratives i i 
I look at them and I look at how they view Imran Khan and I totally get it, right? And what I've tried to do in this piece and what I tried to do in an earlier piece also is to honestly explain to my reader why is it that so many people are genuinely moved by Imran Khan? Why is it that so many people view him as the answer to Pakistan's problems. So I'm, ex- I'm trying to explain that question, right? And I'm trying to explain that as honestly as I can without getting into sort of, you know, and, and, I, and I find this very irritating and I have arguments with some of my, you know, Pakistani friends who'll sort of try to push back and say that, well, no, he's not really popular or no, he's not really honest. And I'm like, you know, you don't have to agree with the person's policies but you should give that person um, their due. So I try to give him his due. That's what I'm doing, right? It's not in the spirit of tearing, either building up or tearing down. It's just in the spirit of trying to be honest of my, about my assessment of his strengths as a politician. Now, in many ways, you know, I mean, are you a Game of Thrones fan? Of course. Right. So who is Imran Khan in Game of Thrones, right? That's a good one. And in, in some ways, I think he is actually a, a Ned Stark-like figure. Huh. And <laughs> many people are naturally attracted to the Ned Stark figure, right? Who's the, I mean, he's, he's, he's the honest guy. Mm. He's the straight shooter. Mm. He wants to do the right thing. And then he gets completely outwitted and outplayed by people who are frankly devious and cunning, and in many ways, perhaps not as good people, right? Um, that to me, not that every Pakistani voter is a Game of Thrones fan, but if you're a Game of Thrones fan, and if you agree with this analogy, I think that encapsulates the appeal of Imran Khan, right? Mm. Which is the first half of my, of my piece, and which has been something that I've talked about in other pieces too. But that's really an, a, a sort of trying to put, your, put myself in the shoes of Imran Khan supporters with a measure of empathy and trying to look at the world through their eyes and look at how they view him. The second part where I kind of argue that, look, I get why you like this guy, but here's why I think he would be a terrible choice. Um, it's not those, it's not three reasons really. In many ways, it's just one reason, right? Mm. There the, are the three, it's, it's one reason. And the core reason is that I believe that at this moment in time, after more than 75 years of independence, Pakistan needs to, at some level, reinvent how it thinks of itself, right? On the world stage. What kind of country is Pakistan going to be? What are the things that are going to drive it? Um, I think it would be much better off if it developed a greater economic focus. Uh, just, you know, uh, earlier this month, I was in, in, in Indonesia and Thailand. Um, it's amazing just, you know, how developed those countries um, have, have, have become. Uh, people talk a lot about the comparisons between Pakistan and Bangladesh, for example. So I think that there's a sort of, the, 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 and at some level, there needs to be a fundamental, in my view, reorientation. And it's not just my view. Other people have made this point, too, from a country that is, basically very intensely focused on geopolitics, whether it's nuclear weapons, whether it's larger causes, Palestine, Kashmir, the Taliban in Afghanistan for a while, uh, whether it's for being a pivotal part of these global alliances, going back all the way to the 50s, you've got, you know, Cento and so on. It's a country that has, from the start, been consumed by high politics, and it's a country that, from the start, in my view, has neglected the economic well-being of its people. So that's my premise, right? My premise is that if you basically are a person who continues the, with the formula that has existed for 75 years, you're going to fail because the formula is flawed. And that is how I see Imran Khan. I see Imran Khan as the most charismatic spokesperson for a failed formula. Huh. But if I may push back, for example, one of 
uh, the reasons you cite is uh, the Pakistani obsession with Kashmir, which you then uh, go on to underscore and, and peg uh, on Imran. However, uh, if I may, uh, any sort of poll today, uh, Sadhanan, indicates that the regular Joe Shmo Pakistani uh, wants to resolve the Kashmir dispute. And in fact, uh, not just Khan, but Khan's um, arch nemesis, the army chief who is in the U.S. as we speak, even he is forced uh, to address the issue of Kashmir. He is forced to leave Washington, come to New York, meet the U.N. Um, uh, boss and bring up Kashmir because, uh, because he happened to be here the same week when India rolled back um, and buried Article 370. Um, I'm not sure that by uh, suggesting that Khan comes from this romantic notion of this Pakistan involved in high politics and geopolitics, I'm not sure if you're actually offering a solution here to the alternative because it seems that your, your piece never really touched upon what the other solutions are. The army continues to call the shots. And in fact, if there's any inventor of this uh, geopolitically obsessed uh, national security state, it is the army itself. And um, if we were to argue, the only pushback one has gotten uh, to that throne, what's the, where's the throne based in Game of Thrones? It's, uh, what's the name of the capital again? Um, King's Landing. The only pushback to King's Landing and the way it has imagined the world uh, has been from the north, uh, literally in this case from the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa where Khan dominates and has been off late in the last 18 months. Um, Khan may have been a very different figure in office, but in opposition, he's actually challenged this thinking. He's actually challenged the, um, uh, the military's status quo. Don't you think that he should be given a chance at this rate, for his changed uh, new tactical form of anti-establishment politics, which represents, in fact, is the birthplace of that very same Pakistan that you critique. So let me try and break that up in you know a few different parts. Right, one of the things you're talking about is is, is Kashmir, and I think I take your point there. Um, it would be completely unrealistic to expect any Pakistani leader, whether uh, civilian or military, to simply say. Oh, well, oh, Kashmir, well, you know, we used to care about that, not so much anymore, okay? So, I'm, I mean, I, I wasn't born yesterday. I think that would be. But I do think that even within the sort of, if you, if you take for granted the fact that any Pakistani government, uh, any Pakistani leader is going to have to um, reflect Pakistan's historical positions and reflect the wishes and desires of Pakistan's people to some degree, sure, fair enough. But within that, I actually think there's an in, there's enormous wiggle room, right? And you could be someone who sort of at a diplomatic level continues to say the things that we hear, but at the same time is willing to deal pragmatically, right? Um, I think the great example over here would be, for example, the, you know, the India-China relationship, not these days, but for several decades before you know, things went south with, with, with Galwan and so on, where there were a whole bunch of problems on the border, but they were willing to pragmatically talk about economic issues, trade and so on, right? And I think that there is a pragmatic end of the spectrum from mm -hmm. a Pakistani position too, and there's a less pragmatic end of the spectrum. The pragmatic end of the spectrum is to not necessarily abandon your core position, but to recognize at the same time that year after year, decade after decade, that position has weakened. That's just an objective fact, right? Um, just in terms of um, the gap growing between the two countries economically, the gap growing in terms of diplomatic sort of uh, uh, heft and so on. Um, when Narendra Modi's government uh, abrogated Article 317 in 2019, I, think, I don't think any Pakistani government could be expected to be delighted but was it sensible to effectively break off diplomatic ties, right? And I think that that is where, where the sort of, where a more measured response would be, I'm not abandoning my position, but I'm going to find a way 
that is that to make that position to not make that position maximalist because if i take a maximalist position then it's going to be difficult for me to walk my way back so that shows a sort of a lack of maturity but forget india pakistan for a second right because that always sort of gets gets a little bit hot um you can see sort of similar situations with you know imran khan's problem with the saudis imran khan's problem with the uae um there was a way in which this sort of hyper idealistic uh view of his foreign policies for example remember you must you obviously you'd remember you know in 2019 he had this idea that he was going to come up with this new tv channel joint tv channel uh, after he met with erdogan and mahathir in new york and there was going to be this pakistani turkish malaysian um and 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 it probably sounded great to him but then you know the next thing you know is that traditional pakistani partners like the UAE like the Saudis are just like hey wait a minute what on earth is going on with this guy and so i think that he doesn't really he he has a gut sense he doesn't think through these positions and i think they have in fact come back to hurt pakistan right um including the visit to russia so it's not just i mean kashmir is one example because i do think and we can talk about this at more more length i do think that uh it is in pakistan's interest i also think it's in india's interest frankly um to have some kind of rapprochement to have some kind of you know a uh, workable uh, relationship um i don't think that imran khan in that context represents reasonableness i think he represents purity of ideas and i understand why people are attracted to purity of ideas i just don't think that is sensible that's the first part Okay. Um on your, let me just quickly get to your thing about the let army. Let me let me give you a little bit of uh, sure. uh, a context there because I think um while that is valid I will push back with respect about both Kashmir and this uh, sort of tearing away from the Saudi uh, UAE dyad as well. Just really quickly. While your points stand um both happened in a context. Firstly, one can assume that Imran's proximity to the military regime at that time um was a factor in uh pushing back against India and breaking of diplomatic ties after the rollback after the abrogation of 370 no pakistani prime minister would have done this uh without looping in in fact without being greenlit by the army in 2019 secondly uh you forget the events of february 2019 when pakistan and india engaged in a bit of an air war and uh the pakistanis shot down an indian mig um things were high in fact uh speaking of pragmatism if anybody was pragmatic in that face off you remember those tense 24 36 hours uh if anybody was pragmatic uh southern you may remember it was probably imran khan who came back saying we've shut down your guy we want to give him back let's deescalate um at that time he in fact warned about the dangers of nuclear war he was the first one to warn about the dangers of nuclear war So while I your point about cutting off diplomatic ties stands I would push back and say A it didn't happen in a vacuum B um it was a tense year for India and Pakistan because of what had happened in Balakot secondly it was in fact the uh Pakistan being felt and Pakistanis being felt let down uh by the Saudis and the Emiratis in the OIC which refused as you remember which refused to back up pakistan because they're so cozy they're so cozyed up with india which now by the way is a strategic partner of the uae they refused to back pakistan and the oic where khan said listen you guys dominate the oic the organization of islamic countries give me the support this is a islamic cause when they didn't show up to his party that's when he started looking around for other avenues other sympathizers like the turks and the malaysians and that's where the tv idea and this other alternative oic idea came from um my my lubbe lubab as we say my summary here would be that khan um if uh, he's not uh, pragmatic and by the way speaking of pragmatic wasn't he pragmatic 10 12 years ago when he started urging dialogue with the taliban at a time when it was very unpopular to urge dialogue with the taliban because that's exactly what ended up happening with the americans pulling out in 2020 it was because of dialogue with the taliban so sometimes yes the man has been considered um uh, ahead of his times when he is called that uh, uh, they say he's not very pragmatic but do you see the context i'm trying to build up here that there's a certain sort of pride the man brings in pakistan sovereignty because as this rentier state as this client state which is always hitching itself 
to the Saudi cause or the Emirati cause or even the American cause, the man has had an alternative point of view. Should he be punished for that? So two things. I mean, I think your point is well taken about the pragmatism that he displayed uh, around Balakot and also that, you know, the fact that that was a very tr- tense and fraught year and also the fact that he would not have been able to do that without a green light from the military. All, all, all fair points. I don't agree with you on, the, on, on his position with the Taliban being a sign of pragmatism because over here what I'm trying to contrast is pragmatism with, uh, with, with, with his ideological affinities, right? So his uh, wanting to speak with the Taliban or saying nice things about the Taliban subsequently, talking about breaking the shackles of slavery and so on, that's perfectly in line with his ideology. So that's not really a question of pragmatism trumping his ideology. That's in line with broadly where he sort of, you know, how he sees the world. That was a um, big diplomatic uh, boo-boo. Uh, that I'll agree right? with you. The, so, the um, but, the but, but I do think yeah. slavery was a bad, bad move. But, but, but so I, I do think that, you know, in, in some... Um, I don't think that if you have a spectrum from uh, confrontational in an ideological way to pragmatic, maybe it's fair to say that I should give him more credit for being, you know, closer to the center on that, or maybe for displaying pragmatism that I have not acknowledged. And I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. Um, but I would still say that in terms of how I see his foreign policy over his four years as prime minister, um, I would characterize it as uh, a little bit more on the ideological side than on the pragmatic side. And part of it really comes down to what you talked about, the pride that Pakistanis feel that, you know, here's this guy who's willing to stand up. for. But, but, but John, the flip side of that is that when Turkey does that, for example, right, it does a per capita income of more than $40,000 now. They've successfully industrialized, right? I remember more than 10 years ago, uh, reviewing a book by Paul Theroux, uh, where he took this train journey, and he was just like gobsmacked. And he said, you know what? I took a train journey through Turkey, and they have successfully industrialized. Um, you could make a similar case about Malaysia, right? Um, Malaysia was, is, was, was, a, was, a, was an East Asian miracle economy. Um, through the 80s and the 90s, and maybe it's lost a little bit of steam. But again, the sort of the 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 achievements there um, are enormous. Um, my view is that, and this is a one of the things that makes Imran Khan attractive. But in my view, is also this fatal weakness, which is that he is like a gambler, who's a very good gambler and will play the hand that he's been given very well, but it's a weak hand. And at some point, you want a leader who acknowledges that he's playing a weak hand instead of a leader who says, you know what, I'm going to play the best bluff that you can with this weak hand. Even though playing the best you can with that weak hand is more attractive to people who are watching. But is that the wisest move? And I think it isn't. So it seems like you're, you're, now you're bringing in the whole populist firebrand aspect, which, which overshadows his politics. But then... Um, let's talk about alternatives. You offer no alternatives in this piece. You critique, you break it down, you talk about his economics, you talk about his obsession with Kashmir, which we've debated, you talk about this whole Islamophobia business, which, by the way, seems like a bit of a real thing. He starts mentioning it in 2018-19. Of course, it's a whole part of his populist political campaign, which it's, it's one part of his populist campaign, but we're seeing it in action these days, and let's just be very honest, what's happening in Palestine is a part of that larger global spectrum, uh, Sadhanand. But I'm not going to waste further time with the critique. There's been no follow-ups from you in this piece, this critical piece, in the ostensibly the, 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 the U.S.'s most important newspaper, about what are the alternatives. Should the army continue uh, being um, everything, the, 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 the all-encompassing army, where... The army chief who's in town is playing finance minister. He's playing foreign minister. He's playing governor general. Um, he's playing information minister. Um, should should the uh, should should the alternatives be people like Nawaz Sharif who failed spectacularly uh, three times because uh, for if nothing else he can't work within the system. He ends up being consumed by this all powerful military. Uh, let's even assume that uh, Nawaz Sharif is an alternative. But you don't really offer a critique of the one organization, the one um, system that dominates the country, which is the military. 
uh, okay, at a time so, when the boss is in town. Okay, two parts. Um, the first, I'm going to quickly disagree with you, and we, it's, let, let's not go on a tangent there. Hmm. But I am going to say that, um, you know, on the Islamophobia question, um, I don't think Imran Khan was particularly uh, principled. I think, you know, taking pot shots at countries like France and Holland is super easy. But in the larger scheme of things, you know, these are countries that have been extremely welcoming to people from all across the world, including the Islamic world. Um, I don't think of them. I, do, I, I, I think it's a little bit uh, I think it's a little bit unfair, frankly, to go after them because they're soft targets and be completely silent uh, when we talk when on, on questions like the Uyghur question in China, which is just. Um, frankly, one of the most sort of horrific cases of yeah. persecution of Muslims on the planet. Yeah. But let's 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 let, let's 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 put that aside for a second and talk about the core of your critique, which is that look, I've pointed out why I think Imran Khan would not be a would not be good for Pakistan, um, and I've pointed out that the main reason for that is that I think there needs to be some kind of reset in terms of how the country conceptualizes itself, and what I see him as is the most impressive, most charismatic spokesperson for the old model, as mm. opposed to the guy who's going to reboot and get you the new model, right? That's, that's, that's the heart of my critique. And then you say, well, who, who else is there? Um, and I will, gr- I will grant you that, that's, you know, that, that is a, that's a valid criticism because... What? No, the heart of my critique is that the old model is run by the same people who kicked him Fair out. Enough. Still so we still have, so we have at this point... If you agree with me that we have at this point one guy, Imran Khan, who stands for the old model, mm. and we have the other guy, Asim Munir, who stands for an institution that has really been at the heart of the old model. So the question really is that if we're going to see the, uh, some kind of reinvention, is it realistic to expect? the re- kind of reinvention I expect. Like no one, no one in their right mind thinks that Pakistan's going to suddenly get a Javier Millet kind of figure, right? I mean, that would be fantastic in my view if you suddenly had a, you know, uh, this, 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 this great libertarian who was quoting Milton Friedman and saying that let's, let's privatize all these loss-making state-owned companies and let's just bring in foreign investment and let's just focus on making Pakistan, you know, the next South Korea. Um, that would be wonderful, but Let's face it, that's not going to happen, right? Well, um, but I, I, I think the question really is, who is l- more likely to be pragmatic? And all I'm saying is that I think the odds of Imran Khan being pragmatic are very slim. And with Munir, at least he's, I'm not saying he's great. I'm not saying that I'm a big fan of the military, but I don't know, right? So I'm willing to say that, look, I'm, Potentially, I don't know what equation emerges, what formulation emerges, but I can imagine a Pakistan in 2024 that begins to take baby steps towards saying that, look, we're going to be focused more on stabilizing the economy right now. We're going to be focused on stabilizing our borders. We're going to be focused on on creating jobs. That's going to be the sort of main goal of the government for the next, say, at least four or five years, as we, as we sort of get our bearings, begin to sort of, you know, um, uh, 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 get our feet again, uh, find our feet again. I don't know if that'll be Munir, right? But it's possible that it'll be Munir. I don't think it's possible that that'll be Imran. Is that a fair answer? Yeah, but it firstly goes on to underscore and you make Imran sound like he's um, some sort of um, a left-wing nut who is uh, nationalizing and ruining the country's economy and not trying to work within the international financial system. And it also makes it sound like Munir gets a free pass for his uh, pragmatic economic approach. He gets a free pass for what is the question um, uh, of fundamental rights in that country, basic fundamental rights and corporate uh, military um, capture. Uh, and the way the elite capture works and is headed by the military, he, he seems to get a free pass. He, he can go on, remove Khan. But Munir is a cipher, right? I mean, we don't know what Munir's economics is, which is not great, but Munir is a cipher. Um, I yeah, agree Munir, that Munir you know, is a cipher personally, but but economically, we can see we can see uh, uh, what Munir is up to. He is uh, making structural changes, constitutional changes to the way um, the Pakistanis now do business through this Special Investment Facilitation Council, which is the new everything. It's the new National Assembly. 
It's the new economic body. It's the new national security body. Um, um, it's headed effectively by him. It's opening up Pakistan by cutting uh, red tape internally, but also wooing uh, international investors. Those are good things. Specifically, the Arabs. Those things could have been done. Those things could have been done. But the the with, fact is within, that this guy is doing a, them within a within a democratic framework. The fact is that this guy is doing them, and those are good things. Um, Imran Khan did not have. I mean, I get this a lot, but the fact is. Imran Khan did not have a good economic record, right? I mean, I just looked at the sort of World Bank site and I picked up a very few very quick quick figures over here. In 2017, the year before Imran Khan became prime minister, Pakistan's for per capita income was $1,568, okay? In 2022, five years later, four of which years were, were under Imran Khan, Pakistan's per capita income had gone up to $1,589. It had Two gone up... Two of those years yeah, of COVID. But, but, but Wajahat, other countries had COVID too. What are the same figures for Bangladesh? It went from 1816 to 2688. They added $800 of per capita income on the same years when they had COVID too. Pakistan could barely add $30. But then if, so you, go, he, but if you go back to the last 18 months, look at uh, the post-Imran world, which is headed by the alternatives uh, tabled by the army and presented by the army. Look at where it's happened to the rupee. Look at what's happened to inflation. Look at what's happened to you, the, the, the cost of living. In the last 18 months, everything has compounded and multiplied. Things have gone bad. But I think it would be fair for us to make the comparison if we give them a little bit more time, right? Because you've got, you have a four-year record of Imran Khan in, in, in terms of his economic policy. Let's see where these guys are. And I'm willing to concede that, let's say, in 2026, you compare the four years of whatever sort of system they come up with. And you say that, well, okay, these guys were even worse, or maybe they weren't. But we don't know that at this point, right? We don't know if some of the FDI stuff is going to pay off. We don't know if some of the sort of stabilization with the IMF is going to pay off. And... We, we should be hopeful that not that, you know, things are going to sort of, you know, take off East Asian style, but I think we can be cautiously hopeful that maybe the worst is behind and maybe they're going to do some, you know, maybe do better. All, all I'm saying is that if your question is, who is the alternative? I grant you, I do not have a good answer to that question. But if your question is simply why I think it would be bad news if this person were to come back, those are my, the main reasons, the ones I mentioned. I'd mention one more really big reason, which I didn't mention in this piece, but I'd mentioned it in an earlier one. Can Pakistan afford a collision right, between the unstoppable force that is Imran Khan and the immovable object that is the Pakistan army? Yeah, you mentioned that before. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll come to that. And, I want to end, end on that. But before, before we go, um, I want you to take your, your hard economist hat on, your Wall Street Journal, your Wall Street Hat on, uh, put it, take it off, please. And instead of the economics, which we can go back and forth on further if you want, but I'd rather I'd rather bury that hatchet for now and move on to the question of democracy here. You're sitting in India right now, which is where you're originally from, the world's largest democracy. You live in these great United States, the world's oldest democracy, and yet you are critiquing Pakistan which could ostensibly be the world's fifth largest democracy if it tried. It's not allowed to try. It's, it's stopped from trying. Um, and the whole, prem I get the whole economic argument. I get how some of his welfare economics were totally over the top. I get it how at a time when he could have invested in infrastructure, he was investing in the billion tree tsunami, planting trees around the country, which have now all been ripped apart and ripped over. I get it how instead of concentrating on Islamophobia, he could have uh, tried to be a little more pragmatic with India, especially when there was an opportunity in 2021 where Modi was coming to town, where Article 370 could have been buried, where the Pakistanis and Indians could have opened trade. He said this to me in his interviews. I get your pragmatic economics argument, but I need you to put your democratic hat on for a minute, man. And I need you to tell me, how do we explain the cost of this system? 10,000 people incarcerated, Khan himself, everybody and their, and their mothers literally um, uh, raided, harassed, arrested. Um, the, the Pakistan, Pakistan's seen a lot of uh, shoddy elections, 
um, it's un- is the unfortunate like nature of the Pakistani political beast. But this particular one, the way it's being handled, we are at the eleventh hour of nomination papers um, this week, and yet the country's what is ostensibly, according to the polls, the country's most popular political party might not be able to run for office. Um, what about those costs, those essential costs of democracy? Why can't Pakistanis be allowed, Sadhanan, to choose their own destiny? And maybe they'll screw it up, and maybe they'll uh, they'll throw him out, or maybe one of them will get really angry and assassinate him, as has happened in in America and India. Why is the system allowed to be captured by one organization which controls all? I don't have any disagreement with that, right? Um, I'm not saying that. Oh, let's keep the it's let's let's do everything we can to keep this person out. And if you know if that's the sort of message that you know people took from my piece, I have to say that that sort of that is certainly not my intention. Um, I'm not saying that Pakistanis don't have the right to elect whoever they want to elect. Um, and I can furthermore, I can I can totally understand why if if he does win, if he does defy the odds, if he does def- the sort of you know defeat this sort of machine of oppression that's been unleashed on him and his party supporters. Um, I could, I'd be able to understand that. Um, my point is just analytical, right? I'm not saying, uh, I'm just saying that, look, if he does come back, let's say, let's wake up on February 9th. And for some reason, you know, but miraculously, PTI has swept the polls. What does the world look like on that day? And I think what it looks like is you have this potentially huge schism uh, between the most powerful politician and the army, which takes another sort of turn, which has been going on for a while. For a while. It'll be a real moment of truth for Asim Munir. That also has implications for the Pakistani army, chain of command, the most functional institution, and so on. Um, you have, you'd have sort of the foreign policy implications that I talked about, um, the way he's viewed in the United States, particularly after some of his you know, wild allegations, in my view, about, about uh, Donald Liu and so on. Um, you've got the sort of other foreign policy implications that we've, you know, we've, we've, we've touched upon, uh, the, the Saudis, the UAE, uh, the potential for thaw with India and so on. Um, and you've got the fact that, frankly, foreign investors are not going to be, or even domestic investors are not going to be particularly enthused by this. So I'm just saying that, look, if this happens, I don't think it's going to happen, but if it does happen, then on February 9th, what you're not, you're not looking at a rosy picture. I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that I approve of the crackdown or that I approve of the, you know, the, the blackout in the media or that I approve. In fact, I make it very clear, right, that I personally think of him as among the cleanest figures in public life in South Asia, right? I mean, the whole idea that this is the guy who's being strung up on, con- on corruption charges, right? What are we talking about, right? We're talking about a place where, like, you know, the generals go and buy pizza chains in the U.S., and, and, and real estate in New York and Dubai and the civilians buy, you know, castles in France. And this guy is being like the biggest corruption scandal you can find in Pakistan is some, some Toshokana gift. I mean, give me a break. So I, I understand the outrage there. Um, I'm not saying that I uh, sort of empathize with that or I think that it's a great thing. Um, all I'm saying is that, look, I, um, three things. I understand why this person is very popular. I, I really do get it. Um, I do not think he would be able to deliver the change that the country needs. Those are my points. I am not arguing for a moment that this means that uh, he should be denied his democratic rights or his party should be denied his democratic rights. And, and I don't think I've described what's happening in Pakistan in those terms. I've used terms like, you know, the media blackout. I've, I've pointed out that you know, the army is arm twisting politicians to leave his party. I have not used language here that is sympathetic to or downplays some of what's happening with PTI. Mm. Okay, before I let you go, last couple of minutes. Um, what did you make of uh, the other guy's trip, uh, Asim Munir's trip to the US? Now, uh, about 10 days in the running, he's uh, met people from the State Department. He's met uh, his counterparts at the at the Pentagon. He, uh, we don't know if he's met the CIA chief. You might be in a better position because you're the Washington insider. Um, he's met his counterpart at uh, uh, CENTCOM. He's met a bunch of think tankers, 
uh, folks like yourself uh, who are plugged into the DC circuit. He's met the diaspora. He's met the guy who runs the UN. He's met Guterres. What do you think of this man? You've seen him in action now. You're watching this space. What do you think of the guy? Look, he's a bit of a cipher still, right? I mean, look at com- compare him to several other recent army chiefs, right? I mean, these were... Maybe it's not fair to compare him to Musharraf, who, after all, was, you know, president too, okay? But look at the kind of reception Musharraf used to get in Washington. Like, you know, it was everybody knew Musharraf was in town. Um, You could say the same to an extent with, you know, with Kayani. You could even say that to a greater extent, you know, with Bajwa. And... you know, he is just, he, he, I mean, some of it just reflects structural realities, right? That Pakistan uh, is just a lot less important in U.S. foreign policy since the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. That is just a very, that's, that's a large part of it. Um, but I think also this guy comes in, you know, there's a tradition of larger than life army chiefs. And, you know, I, I, I read some of the PR that they put out around him about, you know, Hafiz and you know, sort of honor and all of that. And, um, but I, I mean, I, I don't think he's a particularly, uh, shall we say, you know, imposing or larger than life figure. Right. Hmm. Uh, and so the, I, what I was struck by with the visit was just how it was almost invisible. Hmm. The only people, you know, when I was researching my column, the only people I saw who were talking about it were a handful of Pakistan experts. Where was the larger media coverage? Hmm. Where were the op-eds? Where were the articles in the Atlantic? Tell me about Good that. Good or bad? Yeah, tell me about that. Why not? I mean, I've been sort of, it's, it's, a, it's you know, this is part of a larger decline, right? Um, I used two metrics in an earlier piece, which was that in, you know, in, in, in 2011, uh, the U.S. gave Pakistan $4.5 billion of aid. By 2021, that was down to $87 million. Yeah. And then I also did a sort of wow. uh, search into the wow. New York Times, you know, fact, the Dow Jones Fact Taiwan database and to see the number of mentions of Pakistan in the New York Times. In 2011, it was 2,100 times. By 2021, it had like declined by more than half. And I bet you if you did that same thing today in 2023, it would be even less in 2021. So it's just not, it's, it's not top of mind. I, don't, I think some of that is a reflection and frankly, not a very good reflection of how the foreign policy blob, as they say, um, thinks in Washington. There's sort of everyone also sort of tends to go out chasing the latest shiny object. And maybe it's Russia, Ukraine, or maybe it's Israel, Gaza, or whatever. And, you know, ASPAC, as they say, has just, you know, receded. I think that's, that's part of it. But part of it is the fact that, you know, in the end, journalism or, you know, so much of it does come down to stories and storytelling. And on the one hand, you've got this guy who is insanely charismatic with the, arguably the most compelling story in, uh, in, in politics in the subcontinent or one of the most compelling stories. I happen yeah. to think Modi, just in terms of purely a, a life story, Modi has a pretty incredible arc also, sure. uh, albeit, very, albeit very different. Um, and then you've got a guy who basically no one had heard of until the day before yesterday. And so maybe maybe we shouldn't be too mean to Asim Munir about this because, you know, look at what he's up against. But while I, just before I let you go, I know it's late out there in Banaras, but uh, crystal hatting this forward, uh, crystal balling this forward, uh, your projectionist hat, please. There's a school of Pakistani analysts who are beginning to also not just wonder about, besides wondering about their own election, also beginning to pair into the future about the U.S. election and the, the return of Donald Trump. And uh, when he was, for example, uh, when he was uh, uh, ousted by uh, the Colorado Supreme Court a couple of days ago, it, massive breaking news in Pakistan because Donald Trump is seen as the American Imran Khan, but Donald Trump is also seen as a friend of Imran Khan. And so there's this whole school of analysts which is saying, oh, if Donald Trump returns and if Imran is still alive and maybe the Americans might do this or that or the other. Do you add any credence to that evaluation? Um, do you think that the Americans will change their fundamental prism through which they look at Pakistan and deal with the army? Um, will there no. be a shift? I don't think so at all. And I think fundamentally the issue really is that, uh, you know, I don't think that, and I do think that, you know, Trump was personally charmed by Imran Khan. I, I wrote a piece at the time 
uh, praising Imran Khan for that visit. It was a very, very, uh, it was a very well handled visit. And I think it was one of the best visits from a Pakistani perspective to Washington that I'd seen in a long time. Um, um, so there was certainly a personal rapport. We all know that Trump loves uh, celebrity athletes and, you know, it's a long sort of go going back for decades. But let's face it, right? That was about the U.S. wooing Pakistan because there was, uh, they needed Pakistan's help about Afghanistan. Um, Donald Trump does not spend a lot of time thinking about Pakistan. He does not spend a lot of time thinking about uh, Imran Khan. I'm not saying that he would, you know, uh, have any kind of antipathy toward him. But I just don't think that, you know, suddenly if you have Trump showing up, you're going to suddenly, he's going to suddenly say, hey, we really need to do something about the human rights situation in Pakistan. Um, I, I just can't imagine those words escaping Trump's mouth. Sadhana Andume, thank you for your time and this debate. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did as well. Thank you. My, my pleasure. All right. Sadhana is in Banaras, but he resides in Washington from where he writes for the Wall Street Journal. He's written a fantastic piece. It is in my description. I say fantastic because it is debate worthy. It's also controversial. It's also behind a paywall. So maybe you will have to figure out how to get behind it. But I hope you got the gist subscribe. Yeah, subscribe. And by the speak <laughs> of which, share, like, and subscribe to this uh, poor little YouTube channel as well. We need your support. We need to get to 325,000 before the end of the year. Southern, and I hope you're a subscriber. I am indeed. And I'm a regular viewer too. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. You stay safe, my friend. Happy holidays. And I will see you on the other side. Take care, Wajad.